It's February 2nd, 2023. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode 235 of Rook. Shout it loud and set him free. Release the people's filmmaker, Jafar Panohi. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Hello to you from Toronto. Salam, Dustan Aziz. Durud Bashama. He's obviously not the only political prisoner being detained in Iran on bullshit charges right now. But maybe it's worth focusing on one of Iran's greatest filmmakers for a moment. Because if anything speaks to the demonic madness of this murderous regime, it's the imprisonment of one of the country's most celebrated creative talents. If anything speaks to the harm that the mullahs are foisting upon a suppressed and sad and sanctioned nation, it's locking up an award-winning chronicler of life in Iran to the point where his output and his livelihood are gone. Shout it loud and set him free. Release the people's filmmaker, Jafar Panohi. Let's remember, the winner of awards at Cannes and Venice and Berlin and more was arrested last summer for questioning the detention of two other filmmakers. That's right, in Iran with this regime, you get thrown into solitary for asking about someone else being imprisoned. Of course, Jafar Panahi had been arrested before, say back in 2010, he crossed the line by attending a funeral of a student shot dead in the 2009 protests. You can't make this stuff up. Well, fast forward to today, and one of Iran's best known filmmakers has gone on a hunger strike saying, like many people trapped in Iran, I have no choice but to protest against these inhumane behaviors with my dearest possession, that is, my life. A hunger strike is a tragic last resort, a call for attention to a world that should be giving more of its focus on a humanitarian crisis in a country of our ancestry. And there have been a few of these last resorts in Iran recently. Today, photos emerged of Dr. Fadhad May Sami on a hunger strike for weeks, showing tremendous courage as a political prisoner who was one of the first men five years ago to join the anti-compulsory hijab movement. His body is now emaciated, a shadow of his once robust figure. Earlier in the uprising, dissident journalist Hossein Ronaki was on a hunger strike, and more recently, Iranian-American Siomak Namazi, who has been kept in Evin for over seven years now, enduring prolonged solitary confinement and denial of access to medical care. All of this is just one piece of the horrific state of Iran today under the Islamic Republic regime. Kids being shot, protesters being executed, artists in solitary, economy in disarray, basic human rights being pissed away. Sometimes it's too much to deal with as a whole. Sometimes we need to zoom in on the life and courage and treatment of one brave soul. Jafar Panahi is a film director that has never kowtowed to any regime compliance. His career resume is not just a testimony to brilliant realist filmmaking, but to defiance. I had the occasion to interview Mr. Panahi here in Canada almost 20 years ago. He was kind, patient, informative, and giving. He had strong words about the regime even back then, and he gave me his home phone number saying if I could ever come to Iran to give him a call. He was every bit the every man whose generosity matched the impressive caliber of his outstanding direction. His hunger strike is maybe a macabre gift to Iranians around the world, desperately hoping for attention to be placed on the state of their hijacked nation. The least we can do is amplify his name and his cause and bring awareness to his situation. Shout it loud and set him free. Release the people's filmmaker, Jafar Panahi. Coming up on this new edition of Rook, actor and human rights campaigner Shiva Negar joins us from Los Angeles. Martial arts champion and karate star Nassim Voraste is here in the Rook studio, plus the roundtable convenes. This is Rook, episode 235, Release the People's Filmmaker, Jafar Panahi. All right, all right. Welcome to February. Oh. Thank you for joining us from wherever you are around the world. Here we are in the Rook Studio in Toronto. Nassim Voraste. So, uh, regular regular listeners of Rook will remember Nassim. She's been on a couple of times. The karate champion, mm-hmm. um, the karate queen, the, the the one of the the pioneers of uh, the of the female sport, you know, in terms of martial arts, certainly from uh, an Iranian standpoint, and and a, and a Canadian superstar, twelve time Canadian champion. 
I don't know if you heard about this. Did you see what her dojo did? It went viral. So I, so she and and uh, did you see this, Shia? Yeah, uh, what one video? I, I saw, you saw a video. Yeah. Well, I, the reason we're bringing her on, I mean, it's always a pleasure to have Nassim on, and she has been, of course. Uh, um, outspoken about what's going on in mm-hmm. Iran. Uh, you know, her father, uh, Farhad Evoraste, mm-hmm. was uh, um, not just a, um, a huge star of karate, the mm-hmm. po- I guess the, the founder of karate in, in Iran, yeah. uh, but right. also was, um, you know, jailed by the regime and, and uh, uh, at the time of the revolution mm-hmm. became persona non grata and escaped, had to escape right. from Iran with Nassim as a baby. So um, so she is, you know, her feelings are pretty baked in about this <laughs> this regime. And, and when she won the black belt, uh, the Canadian Black Belt Hall of Fame or something award in the fall, she dedicated it to the women of Iran and people mm-hmm. who are, um, protesting in the streets in Iran. So anyway, this week, last couple of weeks, there was a provincial meet uh, in here in Canada, in Ontario, I guess, of of a karate competition, mm-hmm. uh, which her team, her dojo was at, right. and her, her dojo being populated by a lot of Iranians and uh, Iranian kids, uh, they decided to dedicate their fight, their their whole. Uh, if you watch Cobra Kai, you ever seen Cobra Kai I on haven't. Netflix? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're not into the Karate Wars. Uh, it's like the Karate Kid, you okay. know. Like the bunch I've of, seen the Karate Kid. <laughs> well, I think of the Karate Kid. You, you know, these young kids. Right. You know, they want to fight for something. So they decided, um, and I have to ask her how exactly this happened. Mm-hmm. But they were dedicating their their um, participation at this at this. Uh, competition to mm-hmm. Mehdi Karami, Mohammed wow. Mehdi Karami, who was one of the young guys who was mm-hmm. executed last month in Iran and was a combat sport, right. you know, uh, athlete. Um, this this participate they, so they all had these T-shirts with that with Mehdi Karami's face on it, and mm-hmm. they 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 fought for him, and that. Um, event has kind of gone around the world now mm-hmm. as viral as you know especially because it was some young kids right. doing it as well you know and that seems kind of known and and uh, uh, she was just telling me she well, she's going to come into a, the, the Rook studio in a, a little bit to, to talk about this but uh, she was just saying that uh, Mehdi Karami's father had reached out to her and said oh, thank wow. you for yeah so she was very touched That's that amazing. you know it reached him you know in terms of this this testament uh, so she's going to be here, mm-hmm. and uh, before that, we we'll go to Los Angeles and uh, Shiva Negar, um, the actress. Our friend, she's been on the show a couple of times as well, uh, and human rights advocate. Shiva's become very active as well uh, in the last few months. She's attending demonstrations. She's speaking at rallies. Mm-hmm. She's doing a lot of stuff on online. And she's got a significant platform. Um, so we'll talk to Shiva Negar with the backdrop of. Of actors being detained and and filmmakers, as yeah. I with my opening essay there with uh, Jeff at Panahi, etc. Uh, it'll be interesting to get her her feelings as as an actor born in Iran, now in the grew up in Canada and now in the the U.S. and uh, quite prolific, doing a lot of work in in TV and film. So, Nassim and Shiva coming up um, on Monday. We had Sabo Zameni yes. here. And in the studio, and she sang. Yes. You and I, you and I, yes. impromptu. You know, didn't really practice it or yes. anything. Backed her up. You were playing the piano really yeah. nicely, and I was playing the drums. And and she did this piece that she does called Shadowless. Yes, which is of course a Hossein Eptahaj, Hu Shang Eptahaj, sorry, yes. <laughs> um, piece that's yeah. quite famous. Yes, and yes. but she sort of adapted it and and put her version of music to it, etc. Um, so we did this, and and this has gone uh, this is yeah. going bonkers on the internet. Uh, people are, um, you yeah. Know, I received a tons of messages that they said like, "Wow, it's just oh. we got goosebumps." I, well I didn't. I didn't receive any messages. <laughs> <Okay>. I didn't <laughs> receive the drumming, but uh, <laughs> actually, I did. I received a few, but uh, but uh, yeah, it was shared by a bunch of people. And yeah. it, what it is to me, I mean, I I shared it just talking about Sabah's voice. 
this impromptu, you know, her voice is such a tremendous oh, instrument. Yes. It's beautiful. And, yes. and it's a very real moment. She's just kind of yeah. emotively going for it, just sitting in our studio. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it's funny, isn't it? Hey, these, these, these type of recordings, you can go and record an album for months, yes, you know, but and you don't get yes. the kind of energy that you get from doing something spontaneously exactly, like this. Exactly, yeah. I mean, the vibe... Uh, I, uh, the vibe is so hunting you know <laughs> I'm really glad that uh, like you said that I know I know, <laughs> I know. actually Saba <laughs> here's the backstory. story Saba Zamani who is here as our guest on on, uh, on Monday uh uh, she 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 was gonna just sing. We, we said, why don't you do something in the studio? And and she was game. She's a good, uh, um, you know. I really appreciate it when sometimes singers don't want to sing. Yes, you know, yes. musicians don't want to play. <laughs> yes, yes, you know, it's like uh, yeah. here you are. We've got microphones. Let's go. Anyway, she was very very generous and said, yeah, of course. And and so uh, Shia says, okay, well we'll play the music and mm -hmm. you can sing to it, like well, you know, to track, yeah. right? And I was like, dude. <laughs> this is not that sophisticated a song. You're right. a great piano player. Why don't you play it and I'll play it? And he was like, oh, uh, uh, I don't know. You know. And so then, uh, but then we were like, well, let's just try it. Yeah. And, and we, we just oh, jammed it, it once. And she was like, oh, come on, you guys got to do this. And yeah. yeah. And that yeah. was the first take. That was the first take. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. We only did, uh, we didn't practice it. We yeah. did two takes yeah. and we actually kept the first, that was the yes. first take. It was like, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I mean, uh, you know, you and I are just, side players it was all about Saba and her yeah, oh, and her singing but yeah. uh, if you haven't seen that yet go to our YouTube channel or go to our uh, Instagram or her Instagram and see the video with uh, Saba Zamini doing a, an exclusive performance of her piece uh, Shadowless she's become one of the voices of this uh this last few months of mm -hmm. the revolution, yeah. you know, uh, and and she's such a credible voice too in terms of her own backstory of coming from Iran a year ago and having yes. been imprisoned there for you know simply wanting to sing, etc. Um, so let's get to Shiva and let's get to Nasim. Before we do that, we'll do a bit of a rook roundtable here. Um, I guess the one thing I wanted to talk about was, I mean, jumping off from my opening essay mm -hmm. there about Jafar Panohi. This um, now I mentioned him in the essay, Doctor Fadhad May Sami. Yeah. Did you guys see the images I of did. him today? Oh, oh my gosh! Yes. Of course. So he, do you want to explain what what his situation is? Yeah. So um, Farhad May, Farhad May Sami is a physician, civil activist, and publisher who was originally arrested in 2018, and his crime then was for possessing badges that had the phrase "I protest against compulsory hijab." Yeah. Um, he was arrested, and then I think in December of 2018, he was sentenced to six years in prison for just having those badges. There were these, the, the, as we know, the campaigns had begun. Mm -hmm. There were some brave, strong women who had started these campaigns against the hijab right. in the streets of Iran. And, and uh, the story says that, you know, that as, as the story goes, he was one of the first men who actively was out was there. Was supporting, yeah. Um, but, you know, not doing anything particularly crazy. And no. he's a doctor and he's, you know. Exactly. And yeah. at the time, apparently, I think, and I don't know if this is accurate or not, but I read online somewhere that he had six, bat, six of these little pins like there's mm. photos of them they're they're like those buttons that you that you put on backpacks right. or shirts right. and whatnot so i mean i just can't imagine six so years. he's been in jail since then that's right he's yeah. been in jail since then and then these photos um surfaced earlier today um showing the state that he's in and i mean the photos were horrific to see that someone could be in such a frail state well he's apparently his hunger strike has been for a few a few weeks or even months yeah. now so uh, it's not, I mean, it's, you know, I, I, I presume it's one of those hunger strikes where he's only drinking liquids or mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, because I don't, I would know, imagine, it's yeah. Been, if it's been weeks that you can't sustain. But, um, but yeah, it was, it was, uh, as you say, haunting, you use that mm -hmm. word. Really just, he had this emaciated man, and there's pictures of him before, that, yeah. you know, looking quite robust. And, I mean, and, you, uh, could, you couldn't even recognize, I mean, I couldn't recognize him. Yes. If I had just seen the photo of him now, I would have never imagined but that you know, the same person. But, you know, hunger strikes traditionally, I mean, I, I, in the essay, said the last resort. These things are, you know, I mean, when there's no, uh, now it's Jafar Panohi, mm -hmm. as of today, mm -hmm. starting his hunger strike. Uh, you, The frustration level is just at a point of, um, you know, you are detaining us for, 
basically nothing. Mm -hmm. And um, we know the conditions between the psychological torture and the solitary confinement and all of that happens uh, is is treacherous and 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 dangerous and and uh, so they say, oh, the, the last resort is a is a hunger strike. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to say, I mean. You, you know, it's been outrageous. If you remember back in July when they arrested Jeff Hapanahi, uh -huh. this time yeah. we had Bob Akpay and yes, we came in yes, and we yes. talked about it. And it was just so, it was confounding. Like yes. there, it was based on nothing. I mean, he mm. had gone um, to the authorities or he just, he'd gone to the police station or, yes, or the, yes. the prison or something. He said, hey, I just want to find out what happened here. And then they arrested him, yeah. you know? And, and, uh, I hate to say it, put it this way because I don't, you know, I, I, I want him to be healthy. But, but in a way, I mean, someone like Jeff Hapani, we we've known he's been in the prison. We we probably he's probably not being treated well. He's been there for months mm -hmm. before he was, you know, detained uh, a couple times before. Yeah. Uh, you know, him doing this hunger strike is is actually already bringing attention mm -hmm. to him that he wasn't getting. Uh, and of course, there's thousands of others like him, so we can't forget them. But um, if this inspires the diaspora or the world or people inside Iran to, to be shouting his name, I think yeah. this is what has to be done. Yeah, there was a there was a specific line in the in the statement that his son and his wife posted um, that just it's kind of still with me and it and I think he said something like I'll remain in this state until perhaps my lifeless body is freed from prison yeah and I mean with the backdrop of seeing photos of Dr. May Sami and to read that it was yeah. just I mean haunting like Shia said there's yeah. just no other word for it and going back to Dr. May Sami actually um, he wrote a letter as well with with these photos that surfaced and what really shocked me about that letter was the fact that he was still reiterating his same demands that he's been talking about and pushing since 2018 so in his letter he actually said that he's still calling for um, stopping execution of the protesters release of six political prisoners and putting an end to the brutality in the name of forced hijab imagine these political prisoners being this brave mm -hmm. to continue to speak out you know there are people who are subjected to forced confessions yeah. or, or who comply with what the, you know, and you can't blame them. Nobody does blame mm -hmm. them because mm -hmm. under those conditions, you know, who's to say what what anybody can do. And these these guys are just, you know, digging in and, and um, yeah, it's it's profoundly brave and profoundly harrowing okay. to see these these stories uh, and reminders of, of, it's not just that they're in jail, it's the reasons they're in jail are yeah, so crazy. Exactly. I, as I said in the essay, that the last time Jafar Panahi, it was his whole family actually was rounded up in, in 2010, but, uh, but the reason was because he attended a funeral. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you, you know, yeah. this stuff is... Yeah, you, you've got pins on you, yeah. you've attended a funeral, attended you a walked funeral. into a yeah. police station to inquire. Yeah. I mean... Uh, so in the meantime, there's the, the the cleanup from the earthquake in in yeah. um, Hoi, and you you actually wanted to talk about this because you want to talk about the because we do, we did talk about it on Monday. Mm -hmm. There was an earthquake that happened in the Azer, Azerbaijan region of yep. Iran, the the north uh, west part of Iran. Um, but you wanted to talk about this as an example of how. Uh, in and amongst all the other things that the regime is uh, failing the Iranian people uh, at, that includes now helping with this earthquake, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, I feel like there's no shortage of um, ridiculousness from this regime, but in the face of a natural disaster, a 5.9 magnitude earthquake, there's been no systematic help from the government. And not only has there not been any help, they've actually actively been taking action to further harm these individuals. I mean, the, the people start, had started protesting because of the conditions and authorities showed up with water cannons in temperatures that range from minus three to minus eight. And these individuals don't have tents. They don't have, you know, basic necessities. Some of them don't, all they have is the clothes on their back, essentially at this point. Um, the authorities have refused help from organizations like the Red Cross. There's yeah. been reports that the Red Cross had extended a helping hand, so to speak, um, via Turkey. And that's actually been declined. Um, I mean, it's gotten Imagine, to a point. We don't need the Red Cross. Thanks very yeah. much. Yeah. 
you know not only do we not need them but we're also going to take action that's going to further harm these individuals Mm -hmm. and it's gotten to a point where you have athletes and artists and things like that within the country saying okay we're going to do something about it and then when they hear about that they also take actions to prevent them from doing so so um karim bagheri who's a former football player and coach now he had posted on his Instagram, um, I think a couple of days ago, if I'm not mistaken, um, he had included um, information for a bank account where individuals could donate. And he had said that he was going to take it upon himself to take this money to the individuals who had been affected. And I think within four hours of his post, his bank account was locked mm. <laughs> by the by the authorities. So, I mean, it's just... And the I transgression wa- being he wants to support, help the people in the of the earthquake. That's right. Yeah. That that's the crime he had committed. I mean, this is this is the, you know, it's another side of the the coin where uh, we hear that protesters who need medical attention are scared to go to hospitals. To hospitals, yeah. Doctors are scared to treat them mm-hmm. because regime the authorities will sanction, de- de- detain, you know, arrest, whatever, somebody who's helping a protester who's got like a gash in their head mm-hmm. or something, you know? I mean, the whole thing is madness. Yeah. And then there's, um, the, the flip side to that is then there's, and I, I don't know, I mean, what I'm about to say might be slightly controversial, but then there's individuals who are, I don't want to say sanctioned by the government, but there's a pop star who's now come out and said that he's going to put on a concert, a relief concert of sorts, and that seems to be going through. So, <sighs> I mean, there's just this divide of the individuals who are supported and who are not, and then it's the government who's not supporting its own people. I mean, it's just all of it is ridiculous, mm. but I just wanted to shed more light on the current situation there and just talk about the fact that these people need help. Mm. Um, Nick Nikohan Kosar was talking on Monday about how uh, the water bankruptcy mm-hmm. situation, water supply uh, issue in Iran um, is... Uh, underscores the danger of earthquakes. Yeah. Um, I can't, I'm not going to explain the geology mm-hmm. of it, but he did. Right. Uh, and so that the, the, uh, Iran already being an earthquake zone or parts of Iran, that this is worsened by the dysfunction of the water mm-hmm. situation in Iran as well. It's uh, one thing compounding another. Uh, um, what else do we have? Anything else before we... Um, there was a tweet that went viral that was quite interesting hillary clinton tweeted um Mm -hmm. in support of the iranian struggle for freedom this petition this petition yeah yeah. yeah. and i thought it was really interesting 1.3 million interactions in one day so what does that um, mean interactions uh interactions would mean so people liking it on twitter or sharing it or accessing Uh the link things like that um and it's a petition that's initiated by freedom house which is one of the oldest american organizations devoted to supporting democracy around the world um roughly 35,000 signatures, including signatories from Nobel Prize laureates, heads of state, prominent organizations and individuals from around the world, and lots of familiar names. Um, and that was something that, um, you know, we saw shared many, many times amongst Persian Twitter and got a lot of attention. And there's a, the, it's signed by not just um, political dignitaries and stuff, but by famous authors and, mm-hmm. and you know, uh, artists and things like that as well as well as some of the people who are um, prominent in the Iranian opposition That's right. uh, movement it, it speaks to something that I wanted to note today I mean I, I think we have to do a bigger takeout on this and, and uh, bring a guest who um, maybe an academic or somebody who's who's able to sort of zoom out and look at the situation in Iran and, mm-hmm. and the situation in, around the world and, and, and speak to this but to me there's an increasing delta in terms of the the activity of this revolution, let's say, Mm -hmm. there's a delta between, there's a difference between uh, the amount of activity that's happening inside Iran and the amount of activity that's happening outside of Iran. In the beginning, the the, imba- or the the balance was that there was a lot going on in Iran and the diaspora was sort of catching up to support mm-hmm. what's going on in Iran. It feels like for various reasons, including a an incredibly terrifying and brutal crackdown and mm-hmm. and arrests and executions and all that that the activity at least the the activity that is visible has decreased inside Iran but the activity outside of Iran in the diaspora has continues to increase mm-hmm. um, n- not that everyone's as enthusiastic as they were three months ago in terms of posting on social media but the organizing that's happening um, and this this 
petition would be an example. Yeah. Um, the the awareness campaigns that are happening. It does feel like Iran is on the agenda of a lot of sort of people around the world who mm -hmm. are now who you know after a few months are catching up to the fact that something's going on yeah. and there's human rights violations, etc. Uh, there's this big. Uh, demonstration being planned for next, not this weekend, but the weekend after February 11th. Mm -hmm. I know it's going to be big in Los Angeles. It's going to be big in DC. It's going to be big in Toronto. There's a big European version of this. Paris. It's, it's Paris, that's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. It's a global event. Uh, and that activity continues, is ramping up even. Um, so that it's it, the dynamics of it are interesting. Uh, the The revolution has inside Iran has emboldened the the community outside of Iran to take collective action about what's happening inside Iran, mm -hmm. of Iran in a way that's never happened in the last 44 years, right? Yeah, and I think one of the things that I've noticed is, you know, we talk a lot about unity and disunity amongst the Iranian yes. diaspora, but one of the things that I actually have become very impressed by is the fact that we've really started to learn how to utilize the resources we have available to us in countries like Canada, the US, um, parts of Europe, things like that. I mean, you know, we see a lot more on social media about who to contact and which representatives to talk to and what petitions to sign and things like that. Whereas I think at the onset of the revolution, we were just seeing this flood of viral videos being shared or, right. you know, just call to action or demonstrations, things like people that. People saying, so, where's the media? Like, exactly. People like me. But yeah. Us, yeah. But, but uh, also, I think what we're seeing is there's a there's an international sort of um, um, solidarity. Mm -hmm. I don't want to overuse the term because there, there is elements of disunity and yep. uh, people canceling each other all the time and all this kind of stuff that is infuriating. But anyway, um, <laughs> there is there's an international solidarity. But w at the same time, what's happening is I feel like people are taking action to affect the predictable outcomes of, of the governments of wherever they are. Mm -hmm. So you see people in California, Iranian Americans in California, trying to deal with the California legislature or, mm -hmm. or with American politicians. And you see Canadian Iranians trying to push the Canadian government to take action. You see this happening in, in microcosms in different parts of Europe, in right. Australia, where mm -hmm. the, the Australian government today announced new sanctions. And mm -hmm. so everyone's kind of, keeping one eye on the global issue, but but also in their locales and in their local places trying to affect right. uh, a change. And I think that's a, a that's the maturity of the, mm -hmm. the movement five months in. Yeah. Um, but of course, you know, there's still a, a, a struggle around, I find people feeling like um, deflated or concerned mm -hmm. that this is, it's winding down or it's not happening or um, all of that. Yeah. There's definitely a sense of deflation, but I but I think you know at the same time then you go on Persian Twitter and you see Hillary Clinton put out a tweet and then <laughs> spirits are up again. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm sure Hillary Clinton is the answer to, to, to our revolution, but definitely yeah, definitely not. It's, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's it's a it's a help. Uh, anything else? Um, I mean, this is just something to chat about, I guess, not really newsworthy in any uh, way, but um, there was something I read that was kind of interesting, and that, that was about um, a TV series. Oh, Iran. yes. I didn't know this. This is a, a, sh a show called The Fall. Yeah. Do you know about this? Uh, no, no, I just heard of it. Yeah, right, yeah. So good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the president of IRIB, which is the state-run um, broadcasting network, had actually written a letter to the president um, asking for a website called Filimon. The president being Raisi? Raisi, right, yep. Right. Um, asking for a website by the name of Filimo, which is Iran's Netflix, if you will. It's a streaming service um, to be filtered. So I thought that was funny for so many reasons. I mean, first off, you're asking for a website to be filtered you're asking the president for it to be filtered. And then the reasoning behind it was, was even more ridiculous. Filtered meaning censored or what? what does um, mean? Well, it's an, it's an internet based um, website. So I guess what they were asking for is for the website to be filtered mm. off of access for the okay. public. Um, but the reason that, that this individual had done so is because in the show, um, one of the main actors is an individual by the name of Hamid Farouk Najad, yes. who has recently left Iran um, and has been very vocal about his opinions about um, Iran's leaders. Um, notably in December, I think he, he called the supreme leader uh, mentally ill. Yes. 
And so um, the reason now this show has come under attack is because of the fact that the main actor has now left the country and started to voice their opinions about um, the current state and, and the, the regime and things like come, that. Come under attack by the regime itself. Yes, right. exactly. That sponsors the show. That's right. right. So it was just, it was funny for me to see that the show was, you know, it had gone through all of the Ershad and whatnot, if you will. And then now, because the main actor has left and started to voice his personal opinions, this has happened. That's a bad show. Now it's a bad show. All <laughs> Maybe of a they'll sudden. replace him. Well, yeah, yeah. well, it's funny because the producers actually came out and released a statement. I mean, this, it's just comical the whole thing. But the producers came out and they released a statement, um, basically calling um, Farouk Najad selfish and unprofessional. And then went as far as saying, and I'm going to speak as if I'm them for a moment, mm. um, our leader, our sage, and our mentor. How could you insult oh, this individual? Right. And that don't you forget that this is still the Islamic Republic right. of Iran. So they felt the need to, you know, obviously um, voice their love. They they the know leader. where the uh, where the, the the bread is buttered. What do you, what's the expression? Where the, the bread is buttered? Uh, yeah. I don't know if that, Something I'm mixing like that. metaphors. <laughs> they they know where that the, the when they know where they're getting money from. Yes. Oh. They know where they're you know. Uh, what's the expression? Is, is not the bread is they know that. They know. For some reason, I, I'm thinking of a Farsi thing okay. like that, like something about Ruzishun. You know what I'm talking about, Shaya? Ruzishun yeah, Kojun. Yeah, right. That's the Farsi version. <laughs> they know where they're. Oh, they're uh, is, there's a really obvious English one, but I can't think of it right I now. Can't think of they it know either. where their go gooses. No, they know where their bread is. But Maybe bread is yeah, butter. Yeah, they, they know. Sense. They know who's. Yeah, but that doesn't make sense. <laughs> nope. They know who's buttering their bread. They know where their bread is buttered. Yeah. No. No. no, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Something about butter. Something like that. <laughs> they, yeah. Anyway. Okay. Well. So what happened? We don't know what's going to happen to so, this show well, that we would never heard of before. Anyway. No, we don't. The, but those of us who those of who are listening to us in Iran right now are rolling their eyes, going, "The Fall." I hate that show. <laughs> you guys don't even know what you're talking about. No, I mean I know nothing about the show, but I just you know the whole um, conversation around calling Farouk Najad names and and now the fact that he's under attack and the show is under attack and he's not even in the country anymore does this thought. surprise you shia that something that would have been sanctioned or sponsored by airshot then becomes no. a problem because one no. of the actors has a <laughs> no i mean it was obvious from the day yeah. one that farouk najat left the country um it people knew that there is some problem uh, happen here uh, 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 no. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, another topic. I oh, you weren't. Uh, yeah. You weren't going to say something about the bread being buttered. <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe you'd come up with the metaphor. No, no. Yeah. I mean, there is a uh, because you said that. Um, I mean, uh, deflation. People feeling deflated. Yeah. Yes. There is a hashtag actually is trending. Uh, it's called Alayhe Faramushi, which means like against. Um, against like forgetting forgetting yeah. yeah against forgetting and it's trend it's becoming trend uh, these days and people share a memory of the people who died in yes this, yes uh, for this and yet i wanted to say that uh, 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 the, the, these are some acts that people trying to yes mm -hmm. keep it going i mean we vowed never to forget it was only a couple That's months right. ago when Kian died or yeah. Nika or, you know, uh, yeah. Khodanur or any of these guys, people, you know, so. Yeah. And uh, to be fair, I don't think we've forgotten. I just no. think it's, you know, uh, we were in a situation where things were happening so quickly and we yes. were in a rush to get more news and now there's this shortage of news coming out of Iran and I think that's the issue more than forgetting. Mm -hmm. And the news that is coming out is always, is, is, mm, dark or, mm -hmm. or difficult That's it's right. not necessarily uh, big wins constantly yeah. you know yeah. um, thank you very much thank you uh, Pega for our little roundup there uh, thank you Shia we are coming to you on rookmedia.com it's there you can link to all of our platforms we are on an ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity we are on Spotify SoundCloud Apple Podcasts Instagram and CastBox um, so if you if you want to just listen to this as an audio experience you can do that on, as an Apple podcast or a Spotify. Uh, and by the way, you can give us ratings. That always helps us too. Um, if you'd like to see some visuals, however, uh, you can watch us on Instagram and on YouTube. And if you like your descriptions and bulletins in both English and Persian, check us out on Telegram. And we'd like you to subscribe wherever you're at. And please do check out our website, rookmedia.com, where you can find out about all of our programming 
and uh, how to support us as well. Let's get to our first guest. My first guest today is an Iranian-Canadian actress, model, and human rights campaigner who was born in Iran, uh, grew up in Canada after some a harrowing stint in Turkey. She's now a prolific performer in television and film based in Los Angeles. Shiva Negar started her career as a child performer and with determination and focus paved her way into prominent roles in the acting industry of North America. Some of Shiva's significant credits today include the action thriller American Assassin, a starring role in the feature film Becoming Burlesque, and a regular presence on the network series Seal Team and also the series The Cleaning Lady. She is the lead in a just-released new film called Burned by Love, which can now be seen on Amazon Prime. But in recent months, Shiva has also been using her significant online presence to increase awareness about the current uprising in Iran. She has attended demonstrations, spoken at rallies, and worn her politics on her clothing at an awards show. We'll talk about that right now. Shiva Nigar joins me from Los Angeles today. Hello. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for having me back. Nice to have you back on the show always. I mean, the obvious question is, how has your life changed, Shiva, in the last few months since the uprising began in Iran? Um, you know, there are some days that I don't even recognize myself, you know? I'm like, who am I? Because uh, this whole thing started and I there was no thought process, really. Like, I saw what happened right when it happened back in September. And um, I spoke up about it uh, very early on on social media. And um, even though I always consider myself a humanitarian and I've always stood up for human lives are important to me, I hate to see human suffering. And I think right now we're witnessing one of the biggest crimes on humanity. And, uh, and I spoke up about it, but I wasn't expecting it to turn out the way it did five months later. It just snowballed into something bigger and bigger. And, and uh, today, here we are, still fighting and still echoing the Iranian people's voice uh, who are fighting for their freedom still. Yeah, I mean, I know you've never been shy about um, humanitarian causes and, yeah. uh, and equality for women, et cetera. But I saw you, uh, I, there was a TV clip or somewhere you were introduced as an activist. And I thought, this must be an interesting moment for Shiva. I mean, h- how does it feel to be seen and heard as an activist? Um, it, to be honest, Gian, it's still strange to, <laughs> to have that title because... Um, I never considered myself an activist. Yes, I was always a human rights advocate and I like to support, contribute, sponsor. And um, and now, and I don't ever want to take credit from, there are people who have been doing this for years and I always call myself sort of like an overnight activist, but it hasn't stopped, you know, um, or activist is actually a term I've been using. <laughs> um, and... It, Honestly, it doesn't matter to me what the title is. It's just something that uh, it was this fire and this rage that just started. And I I, I can't stop it even if I wanted to. Um, And I'm just going to do whatever I can at my own capacity um, to to be for them and to be there for them and to support them and and fight their fight. It's so interesting, huh? Like that visceral... Um, fire and rage that you talk about. Yeah. I mean, I feel the same thing. Obviously, it's driven me. And but I mean, you are somebody who, like me, has lived most of your life outside of Iran. Um, if you were to try and identify it, what it is, what what it is, and what it is this time in particular that is that is the fuel for that fire and 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 rage, uh, besides the obvious, the atrocities of this regime, et cetera. But what, what do you think it is that has so driven you now? Um, to be honest, social media is really powerful. And we've been seeing one of the most, one of the biggest citizen journalism, I like to say. So, the clips, the videos, a, a lot of atrocities were recorded and and seeing these videos were very, very, very disturbing. And when you see what's going on and those brutal crackdowns recorded from the hands of the civilians themselves, you know, uh, even some of them who were shot in the middle of videotaping, um, how can you possibly turn a blind eye mm. 
to that. And seeing those clips and videos uh, made me realize, again, I know this has been going on for years and years. And uh, when I speak to my parents, you know, since the first revolution and, and they, they've seen so much more than I have, obviously, because I didn't grow up there. Um, I was seven when we left. Uh, and I've sort of always been the person that chose when to watch the news, chose what goes into my head. You know, when I would wake up in the mornings and uh, set myself for positivity and, you know, but now I'm chasing it because I want to know what's going on and I want to know uh, what, and, and I feel this is very close to home for me. You know, I was, I could have easily been one of those girls on the streets, you know. So, of course, it, it really hits home. You've said you feel... Uh, as an Iranian living outside of Iran, that it's your duty, wherever you are in the world, to be the voice of the people of Iran. I'm, you know, it, that's an interesting, that's interesting language. Um, no one would fault you if you were someone who turns up at some demonstrations and posts a couple things on on social media. But your duty to be the voice of the people of Iran. Tell tell me about taking on that responsibility. I do. I feel very responsible because um, I came from there. If I was in Iran, which I easily could have been with my family, if my mom didn't fight to get us out, um, I would have been on the streets. I would have been one of those girls risking my life. Uh, my life. And I'm here now, but that doesn't change things. I'm I'm one of them, you know. So I see them. They're my people. They're my brothers and sisters. And they're doing exactly what I would have done if I was there. And the fact that I'm here, it's actually, there are more opportunities for me. And it's a learning process, you know, I'm learning as I go, because at first I was so overwhelmed with emotions and, mm. and sadness and anger, and I didn't know how to deal with that and what to do about it. But I said, okay, I'm in a, a democratic free country. I'm in the free world. I have free, a freedom of speech. I can do something about it. You know, so it's like, okay, let's let's take actions here that those people in Iran can't do. You know, they're crying for help. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's amplify their voices. Let's contact representatives here. Let's go to rallies. Let's raise more awareness. Let's do so. So I'm constantly and I'm learning as I go, trying to see what actions I can t take to uh, to get their voice be heard uh, globally, if I can. And yes, I I feel like it's definitely my duty and responsibility as a, a, a born Iranian uh, woman living uh, in North America. Are you, are you uh, frustrated at Iranians in the diaspora? I mean, I, I know you're not going to want to be judgmental, but are you frustrated at Iranians in the diaspora who are not as active as you? Um, no, I... I wouldn't call, to be honest, I'm more frustrated by people who uh, are not uniting the way they should. Um, I can't really speak for other people who are more active or less active. I, I can't judge. I don't know what's going on in their lives and it's really not my place to, uh, to judge them based on uh, how active they are. However, I do know that for all of us, we do have one main goal and it's really important to stay focused on that goal and i do get frustrated when there are distractions created you know um one thing i always talk about is empathy i think we really lack empathy in this world and um actually to be honest going back to what i know best uh my acting uh, one of the best ways to create empathy is through storytelling, you know, uh, through either, whether it's based on a true story, whether it's documentary, whether it's fiction, um, film, uh, TV, storytelling, it's a window into people's lives. And, and that's how you can try to understand them better. Um, for me personally, that actually helped me a lot too, because when I'm playing characters, especially when they're inspired by true events or whatnot, I can't judge my character now, can I? So there are a lot of choices that my characters uh, make that I, I, as Shiva, may not agree with them. Mm. And 
I can't judge what my character wants to do. I have to actually dive deeper into the character, into the layers of what happened to her, how she was brought up, why is she doing what she's doing, why is she choosing to do what she does, and the choices she's made in life, and try to understand those layers of of the why, and understand her before judging her. Um, and to me, I feel like we lack that because a lot of people, um, I think, uh, you know, especially again, going back to social media, it's such a powerful tool to, mm-hmm. uh, to create unity, to spread awareness, positivity, um, but it could be very toxic as well, right? Mm-hmm. Um, some people can easily sit behind that screen and be judgmental and creative, uh, Sorry, not creative. Create divisiveness mm-hmm. and uh, and negativity, and that's very counterproductive to, especially to this movement and what we're doing, and a distraction and a huge distraction. Yeah. And and before doing that, and that's what frustrates me. You know, when people do that, and and sometimes I feel like when I say lack of empathy, because I feel like when you suddenly do that, you're not really considering or maybe thinking through what you're doing to that person's life you know you don't know you never have the whole picture and um when we watch the news when we watch uh videos of atrocities and whatnot it's very uh black and white you know i feel like they trigger instant emotions uh whether that's that's anger sadness um and you want to right away do something about it so it takes me back to when you give an advice it's like you know, follow your heart, but take your brain with you. Um, and when you watch something and you go into someone's life, then you see, oh, this explains why this and that, which is again through storytelling. And I feel like people need to sort of think about that a little more before they, you know, take up their phone and right away try to judge someone mm-hmm. or bring someone down and, mm-hmm. and play with someone's life without knowing more about them and and create that distraction and stay away from unity. And I think that's what I'm constantly pushing for yeah. to put, everyone has their own opinions, everyone has their, are entitled to their opinions, but put those aside, let's focus, we're all in this together, so let's focus on what our common enemy, who our common enemy is, what the main goal is, and have that one voice because that's when the, it's going to be the most powerful. That's it's well said. You actually spoke at a rally here in Toronto um, last I month, did. and and you, you it was exactly on this point. You were appealing yeah. to the the Iranian community, the Persian community, to put um, at the very least put our political differences aside and unite yeah. uh, for the freedom of of Iran. It's a funny thing where. Yeah. Everyone says this, let's unite, you know, let's be, <laughs> and then the next minute they're, you know, attacking, canceling someone or attaching, attacking each other for political differences or saying, your guy doesn't represent me or this person, it does represent me. And, and um, I, I'm not sure how we heal that, but I, I applaud your, your message because I, I really think we, we have to each kind of you know, take a beat and, uh, you know, before we tweet something or say something or whatever and, and kind of go, well, how, how am I helping here? If I, if I say, you know, this woman doesn't represent me, what she's saying, et cetera, how is that helping the, the, the cause? And, and especially as the, the revolution is being carried at this point by uh, the diaspora, it, it, it makes sense that this ain't going to happen if we're all divided, right? Yeah, and and you know, I I want to stay positive because obviously we feel the urgency uh, because if I feel like it's, it feels closer to home for us, but things are happening, you know, and those obstacles uh, that come along the way, I like to look at them as stepping stones. There are things happening, you know, whether it's on the uh, Women's Right Council and uh, you know or UN and. There are steps being taken, and we have our amazing uh, activists who have been doing this for years are meeting with the world leaders. And um, I just think that we need to work on the unity a little more and constantly remind ourselves. And just like you said, take a minute before reacting to something or or before trying to single someone out. Take a minute and say, is this going to help uh, this movement? Is this going to help the revolution? 
can I take I take a couple of steps back and just talk about your ask you about your personal con- connection to um, what's going on in Iran and 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 what's happened over the last four decades? And you know, you talked about your mother helping basically get you guys out of their escape. Um, you you tell a story about how when you were a kid in Iran, you looked older than your age, and at the age of seven, your mom would actually call you Shion. Uh, and, and pretend you're a boy in public. You had short hair to avoid you having to be questioned about why you're not wearing a hijab or a headscarf because you looked old enough to need to wear one. The story sticks with me because it's it's kind of mundane, but it's but in its in in the fact that it's mundane, it's it's an absurd example of the madness that people have had to deal with under this regime, that a little girl has to be called a little boy uh, and, and all that goes with that. Can you, can you reflect on that story at all? Yeah, I mean, I was super young. So uh, back then, I didn't know what to think of it. All I knew was, and what I can recall is, my mom hated uh, the whole scarf business. She hated to wear a hijab, okay. and. And she wanted the freedom to choose, uh, which she had before the revolution. Um, And whether that affected me, I'm sure it did as a kid. I personally, at that age, uh, from what I knew at that age, I didn't like it as well. And um, that was a solution that my family came up with so that I can avoid... uh, and choose whatever I wanted, although it still wasn't freedom to choose what I want to wear because I had to dress like a boy in order to just avoid wearing a headscarf. Um, And that's the solution they came up with. And I remember uh, my mom took me to a a hair salon and cut my hair really short. And when we were at home and we, uh, I recall like a a small conversation between my mom and dad and they're like, we're going to call you Cheyenne when we go on the street so that you're not stopped again. Because I used we used to get stopped uh, a couple of times at stores. I remember, I think it was like a, a woman lingerie store. I have this very vague memory. And this woman in a, in a chador, she came up to my mom and she said, what are you doing bringing your son here? Uh, that was actually... <laughs> after we had the haircut and I was dressed like a boy. And at that point, so it sort of backfired, you see, in some situations. On the street, I was more free to walk without worrying about wearing a headscarf. But then it also backfired when we were at that store. And my mom had to actually tell that lady, it's a girl. She's a girl. It's okay. She's okay. But, you know... there are these people that are constantly walking around and telling you what to do and right. why you're doing it. And it's, it's, it's hard to, for me, it's very hard to digest that. Um, even these days when I have a conversation with my mom, my mom's like, I'm not sure if you would have been alive if you were in Iran because I'm, I grew up in a free world and I'm very outspoken yeah. and I'm not sure how much of that I could have tolerated. And I definitely would have been one of the, people protesting on the streets about it. So, um, yeah, so that was the highlight of my uh, uh, childhood before, right until we left Iran, and then well, I didn't have to worry about that again. Well, spe- speaking of wearing what you want to wear, and fast forward to this fall, you wore a dress that had Women, Life, Freedom emblazoned on it back in November at the Television Academy Hall of Fame Awards. Tell me about the kind of reactions you got. Oh, uh, yeah, it was great. I, I, the second I got invited to that event, I said, okay, this is my chance. And that's not necessarily a sort of event that you see too many Iranians, but it's, it was at the peak of this, this movement. So I contacted one of my favorite uh, designer, uh, Gila, Gila Atelier, and uh, I told her about the event and we decided to make this dress. And I wanted the dress to, to make a statement. I wanted it to be loud and I wanted it to make a statement. I didn't want it to just be uh, a color or, or something that someone can look at and not notice. So we went with this sort of pearl white uh, dress and in red, we put woman life freedom. And I wanted it to be in English uh, because I believe I was the only Iranian at that event. Um, it was very interesting, you know, because 
I had a mix of reactions. There were a lot of people who came up to me and said, thank you. Mm. A lot of Americans, thank you for wearing this. Thank you for raising awareness. And they knew what was going on. Um, there were a few people had no clue. So I enlightened them and I talked about it. So it was a great conversation starter mm -hmm. for me to be able to uh, spread more awareness about what's going on in Iran. Um, there was this lovely, lovely woman who was really touched by it. And she videotaped me and, and she told me to please speak up about this. And, and she recorded me and she said, I'm going to post this. I'm going to send this to all my influential friends. And, um, and I got very emotional and, uh, so yeah, it, it was, it, I'm very proud of, of what we did. And, uh, I'm always going to use any opportunity like that to be able to, uh, tell the international community about, about the Iran. It's heartening to hear these reactions. I, uh, we had, um, Nicole Ansari on the show, uh, last month yeah. or a couple months ago. And she also, I think it was the, the, the international Emmys or something she attended yeah. and, and more, um, or had that painted on her, her chest or something and, and uh, yeah. said that she yeah. got really positive like uh, reinforcement and, and support from non-Iranians, which is always nice to hear. Shiva, as an actor, how do you how do you feel or how much are you in touch with all that's happened to the artistic community and, and actors in Iran um, from prominent actors being imprisoned, of course, Tarane Ali Dusti, others, uh, to, to the great filmmaker Jafat Panahi being on a hunger strike now. Um, what what does it feel like to be a working actor in Los Angeles, seeing the situation in Iran for your your um, career, brothers and sisters? Um, it's funny how you said that. That's the thing. If I feel guilty in a way, and I I, and I know it's a very bittersweet feeling because I'm very grateful to be able to do what I do and, and, and I love what I do and I'm very passionate about it. You know that it's been years that I've been, you know, uh, following this and I'm not in uh, touch with them on a personal level, but when I see the risks that they take doing what they do, which is the same career that I have in North America and the risks they take uh, speaking up about this, knowing that they may never, most likely may never work again. Uh, you know, they may, never, they may never tell their stories and pursue their careers. And, and Taran Ali Dusti went to prison for it. And, and I was very vocal about all that. And I, I spoke up about it. But that all contributes to me feeling so responsible to speak up about this. And uh, when that happened, actually, uh, I contacted... Uh, Aside from just social media, I contacted my own contacts, like people I know here, directors, actors, and and I told them about it. I'm like, this is what's happening to to fellow actors in Iran. You know, they can't they can't work, they can't do this. Um, so it it only pushes me to honestly, Gian, it only pushes me to tell more stories mm. here. And I'm actually writing my own stuff right now, and. Um, I think there are so many, I think we are, of course, underrepresented here. Mm -hmm. And there are so many fascinating stories that need to be told. And uh, that's one thing that I'm focusing on this year to create uh, my own projects based on my own experiences, based on what I know and what I can bring to the table the best, considering my ethnicity and my background and uh, being born there. And um, and and I'm going to definitely incorporate all those stories into my storytelling in North America to just continue raising awareness about them, their lives and, and the whole movement. Right on. Represent you, you are yeah. living in the United States now. And, um, uh, I know you have an opinion on this cause you posted something about it. So I want to ask you about it. How do you, how do you feel about the ongoing signals from the, the government in the U S the Biden administration that they're somehow looking for diplomacy um, with the Islamic Republic or a resuscitation of the nuclear deal. You saw my frustrated video on diplomacy. I did. Yes. <laughs> um, that that's another thing. Again, it's a learning curve. I was never into politics, and obviously, you can't really advocate for 
free Iran and not get involved in the politics aspect of it. Um, but one thing I do know, I mean, yes, I wasn't raised there, but I was born there and all my life, up until I was seven when we left, my whole teenage life, growing up in Turkey, Canada, I know so much about that regime through my family, through our culture, through everything. I know uh, firsthand from what I've seen, how they operate. And, you know, I respect all the secular democratic countries for following the rules and regulations and, you know, the jurisdictions and everything. It doesn't quite work with Iran because and we've seen that from the very early on when they took hostages for 444 days back in, you know, the first revolution. Uh, the president couldn't do anything, you know, because they're constantly trying to use diplomacy. And they're, the fact that they're still talking about that, uh, it's unbelievable to me because they should know better. Mm. Uh, they should know that that never worked and it just doesn't work with this regime and yes i've been very clear about this uh, and, uh, and my comparison it's literally uh saying that there's like a bunch of uh criminals or a mafia and you know trying to teach them how to follow rules right. and uh negotiate in, in a diplomatic way it, it's just not gonna work i mean and look at the way they're treating their own citizens and and um so that to me the fact that that's still being discussed is sort of extraordinary to me it should be out of the question at this point i think how how have how have you witnessed opinions in the iranian community around the um what the in the us around what the government's doing or whatever i mean what what is the you've been there for a few years now in in southern california in los angeles um has does it feel more unified that unity that you were calling for that we spoke about a few moments ago. <laughs> what have you seen in the atmosphere of LA or um, Southern California, the de demonstrations you've attended? Has yeah. that unity that you've been aching for been apparent? Um, there's always room for improvement, but yes, to be honest, I personally, I feel the most unified with the Iranian community. I was never involved so much uh, and, and be in a, uh, consistently in contact with other fellow Iranian freedom fighters. And and to me, that's very inspiring. Um, there are a lot of uh, constant discussions, events being being planned uh, and, and the rallies. It's amazing and it feels great to come together. Um, but of course, there are a lot of segregations as well, wh whether it comes to your political parties or, you know, who represents who. And um, a, a lot of people try to control things. And I think we need to just let that go. Um, the whole point of freedom of speech is for everyone to say what they want to say, but the, at the end to be and stay united for the sake of this revolution. Um, but it feels great uh, to feel this unity, especially when you show up. Um, at, there's a huge rally coming up on February 11th. Yes. There's a huge uh, uh, singing uh, event coming up this Saturday in Los Angeles that we're going to sing a Baroya song. Um, they're looking oh, for Oh, I heard 16. about this. Yeah, there, there's people from uh, a bunch of like artists and people from all over are going are gonna to do this this song at, at once or something. Uh, what, what can you tell us anything about that? Yeah, um, I mean, I just recently found out about it. Uh, uh, Taylor Hansen, I believe his name is. There are a lot of Iranian and non-Iranian artists involved. Um, some of them are nominated for the Grammys, and uh, they uh, planned this uh, whole thing. There's an entertainment lawyer. Her name is uh, Katie. Uh, she's a part of the, this, and they are asking for. 16,000, at least 16,000 people to come and sing. And uh, be for the 16,000 people that are in prison right mm. now in Iran uh, to represent them. And they have uh, rented out the same studio that recorded the song, We Are the World. Mm. Yeah, remember the song. So uh, 
it's iconic, I think, and it's a, a it's a historical uh, moment, historical day, and and I think it's going to be really special. And of course, I will be there to show my support, and I'll take my singing voice. and uh, And we're really hoping that uh, the song Baroye will win at the Grammys. We're very hopeful. I don't know so, that I've uh, heard your singing voice. I mean, I think with the sixteen thousand others, yeah. it might get drowned out. But um, unless you've That's- got some lead part. That's exactly why I'm going. <laughs> you won't hear my singing voice with the 16,000 people. Um, let me ask you about, before I let you go, I, uh, uh, two things. One, I, I want to ask you about your latest um, film project. But but before that, y- you know, we've talked a fair amount on this program about in recent weeks about the psychological toll um, that this, that the, that the atrocities and the, the horrible news that comes out of Iran takes on all of us uh, as a global Iranian community, not just the people inside Iran, but but those of us who are wake up each morning scrolling through and 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 you know seeing more horrific news. And I'm thinking about you and how involved you've been, and talking about this being your duty, uh, and your your partner is Faradad Farzad, who of course is a an anchor at uh, Iran International. He has to be involved in this stuff in with Iran 24-7. Um, do you have a practice of how you pace yourselves to not get drowned in the sadness or rage around all that is happening? Um, you would think I do. Um, I try to. I try to. Uh, I want to say that Faradot has thicker skin because he's been used to this. This is what he does for a living. And he's been reporting on these things. I was, on the contrary, the type of person who uh, actually never wanted to know uh, until I chose the right time to have that information enter my brain. And I would, earlier on, I had asked them before this whole movement started, I'd asked them not to share a lot of the devastating news to me. until I'm ready to to hear them. Mm. Because, for example, I didn't want to start off my morning like that. Mm. And I, and to be honest, I, I'm still that way. I'm all about spreading positivity. No matter what's going on in the world, we should never lose hope. And I never want to let people down. I never want to uh, put anything negative out there. I know it's hard with what's going on, but we. I always like to look at the light and the positive side of everything. Uh, and that over time transitioned to me now waking up every day chasing the news uh, of what's going on, me asking him and being more proactive uh, about the latest uh, mm. news, watching things live. And and I've had times where he, he's like, who are you? You know, because I'm, I'm a completely right, different right. person. Um, and... He was I hoping he was hoping that you would be his outlet that would be outside of the 24/7 news cycle, right? Oh no. No, and to be honest and I'm not saying this is healthy but 90% of the conversation we have is now is about this. Well, that's the thing. I was thinking, I mean, you have to, you know, and and, and I mean, well, everyone has to pace themselves. But when we talk about this being a a marathon not a sprint, you have yeah. to work, I mean, do you, can you guys like just sit and watch a rom com, or or does it is is that a a possibility? Uh, we tried even recently, not recently, but uh, I think it was like a month, a couple months ago. I even released a, I put up a video uh, be- because I put up so many videos and and posts based on this, and I put up a mental health video mm-hmm. just to remind everyone. Uh, which actually I was sort of bashed for because there were some people that are like, oh, people are dying on the streets and you're talking about mental health. But I think it's important to talk about that. And uh, if we are not taking care of our, of our mental health, we can't keep fighting. We can't keep doing what we're doing. And uh, it's hard because you're seeing all these videos. It, it really bothers you. You you get depressed and then you got to just get back up and say, okay, I'm here. I'm still standing. I'm still alive and I can do this and this and this that they can't do over there. So you keep going. But yes, I I definitely think that you do need days to, to take back, to distract yourself. Mm. Um, I wouldn't go as far as watching a rom-com, um, but... <laughs> Uh, the work that distracts me, having to read scripts uh, distracts me and getting to other characters uh, 
distracts me, but it still sort of goes in circle because it still creates more empathy. And I think about all the other people and what's going on in their day to day lives. And um, but balance is key. And uh, I'm not going to say I've mastered that the last five months. I feel like I was a lot more balanced when it came to uh, handling things and and proportionate to the sizes, you know. Uh, but um, I'm working on it. I'm working on it, and and it's hard to well, maintain t- t- balance. Talking about your work is a is a is a good segue to a final question. Um, I know you didn't want this interview to be focused on your your latest gigs and and TV series and films, and uh, but you have been pretty busy. You have been, um, uh, and as ever, I'm I'm so pr- proud of you. You know, in terms of all that, uh, all the. Um, the, the, the gigs that you've gotten in terms of prominent TV shows and, and, and films. This, I, I watched Burn by Love uh, last night, your latest, uh, this film that uh, has come out on Lifetime TV and Prime Video, um, a, um, uh, a, a, a warning film about uh, um, online dating, amongst other things. Um, tell me about what, what, what the latest, that's the latest, tell me what else you're working on and what people can, can see. Um, that Burned by Love is the latest release of my feature film. It's inspired by true events. Um, there was a similar documentary uh, made on that. It was called, I think, Tinder Swindler. Uh, but yeah, it's it's inspired by the true story of uh, scammers on on dating apps and uh, and uh, men who have uh, scammed some of their loved ones or some of the women that they. I pretended they wanted they were interested in and tried to date um so because it was inspired by that i uh, i wanted to tell it and i was interested and it was just released on lifetime network it aired on tv and now it's uh, available to stream uh, on prime on amazon prime i have one more coming out um it's another thriller and it's in post production right now, and I'm told that it's coming out later this uh, this year, uh, mid the, the summer this year. Um, I can't say the name because it's a working title. It's, it'll probably change, but okay. uh, that's also a very uh, uh, heartfelt story. And it's actually my first time playing a mom. Oh, um, yeah. How did that feel? To, different um the closest experience i i've had to uh, that motherly uh figure is my nephew so i always kept that close to my heart every time you know i had to show up for for my eight-year-old daughter in the film and uh it was interesting it was very interesting uh it's a it's also a a great story about a, a struggling single mom and uh i can't wait for you guys to see that and uh, and of course i've been recurring on uh on the show the cleaning lady yeah. first first season and second season big they show just got it's a big show yeah I, it's a great I see it everywhere show yeah on- yeah um it, it, c- congratulations on that um and Thank you. uh and people can see burn by love that's out now we'll look forward to your new film coming out um shiva thanks for taking the time today and and giving us your thoughts and insights and and um for the work that you're doing in terms of amplifying the freedom movement in, in iran and uh it's always a pleasure to have you on the program of course thank you so much for having me back Bye-bye. it was nice to see you nice to thank see you. you too see you <laughs> Bye. bye this dream I'm dreaming Won't you wake me up tonight Cause this life I'm living Doesn't really feel like mine. This strange dream Never thought you would leave. I never thought I'd have to start again. This is Rook episode 235. Free the People's Filmmaker, Jafar Panahi. 
I'm Gian Gomeshi. Our next guest has walked into the Rook studio. She's here in Toronto in our studio. She is an Iranian-Canadian athlete known as the Karate Queen. Nassim Varaste is the most accomplished Canadian karateka in the history of this sport and one of the most respected karate coaches in the world. She is the 12-time national champion for Canada, who is also a highly successful sport club owner and instructor and has worked alongside Canada's national teams. She's been very active since the uprising began in Iran in September, supporting the cause of freedom in Iran. And Nassim actually initiated a petition drive calling for justice for fellow combat sport athlete Mehdi Karami to save him from execution. He was executed last month, of course, this past week at an Ontario Provincial Karate Tournament. Nassim and her team held a moment of silence to honor the memory of Mohamed Mehdi Karami and dedicated their fight and their competition to him. The news and photos of that event and those actions went viral. Right now, Nassim Varaste joins me in the Rook studio. Hello. Hi, Gian. How are you? Nice to have you back here. Thank you. It's nice to be back here. Interesting how different circumstances bring us together for these interviews. This is a certainly a different circumstance from talking about your, your career and combat sport. Um, I want to get into the events of this past week and, and the dedication to, to Met Academy that went viral. But first, let me ask about how you've been processing the ongoing uprising in Iran in recent months. In November, when you were being inducted into the Canadian Black Belt Hall of Fame, congratulations. Thank you. You said, and I, let me quote you, I dedicate this to the strong and brave women of Iran who are currently leading a national movement against the oppression of women. One day soon, you will break free from the chains of oppression and win your God-given rights and freedoms. Nassim, tell me what this uprising has meant to you. You know, it's like our departure from Iran, you know, just having escaped my father, having been tortured by by the regime. Um, you know, it's it's been something that hits really hard for me. Like it really, it, um, it means a lot to me at a very personal level um, to finally see the change in Iran to see the country liberated, to see the youth having the same opportunities and women being free from oppression and all these things. So it's been something that, you know, a lot of us have been, I guess, waiting for, mm. for a long time. And, you know, throughout the years, throughout the last 40 something odd years, there's been a lot of uprisings, you know, bubbling up and they've always been crushed and silenced and mm -hmm. everything. But mm -hmm. this, this, this time it's different, you know, this time it's, it's at a different scale. It's the men and the women together. It's the young, it's it's the youth, it's people within Iran, it's people outside of Iran. Mm -hmm. It's at a much different scale. Um, so- You were just talking about liberation as if it's already happening in Iran. I mean, are you, um, do, do, do you feel like this, I, it feels redundant to be asking this question five months in, but unfortunately it's still a relevant one. Do you feel this is the time? Anything is possible, Gian. Anything is possible. Um, I think with enough, um, with with enough international pressure, um, this is like very political and very complex situation. Um, but with enough with enough pressure on 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 the Iranian regime, things could collapse and we could see change. So, I guess we're all just having our fingers crossed and. You know, some of us are more active than others, and some of us are just silently hopeful. When you dedicate that that award to the strong and brave women of Iran, yeah, you're often spoken about as a strong and brave woman. You know, um, a pioneer in your support in your sport mm -hmm. uh, for Iranian women, for even Canadian women. Um, tell tell me how watching what the women of Iran or the and the young people of Iran have been doing in recent months has inspired you or surprised you perhaps yeah i mean that night um i didn't actually post anything about it I, sh I should have in hindsight um i gave a speech that night to a room like maybe full of like thousands of people and um not not Iranians. Necessarily. No, they were they were they were not Iranians. Right. They were members of of the martial arts community, and I mean like the the greater martial arts, like mm -hmm. everything from traditional martial arts to mixed martial arts, uh, basically across the base basically across the country, 
And I dedicated my award to the brave women of Iran, as you know. And um, and I was the only female recipient that mm -hmm. evening, um, you know. And it's like to be the only woman receiving the award. And on top of that, to be, you know, w the country going through what it is right now and complete turmoil, um, you know. And I know deep down in my heart what the what the women of of, of our country are capable of of they're capable of everything you mm. know i've seen the best of them in sports and academics and sciences and medicine across all the fields but most of them unfortunately are the ones who've been able to basically achieve everything because they've already left the country because they're yeah. outside of iran you know and it's an absolute shame, and I would love for the women within Iran one day to have that, to have that same opportunity. And that's exactly what they're fighting for right now: is for the same opportunities. You 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 mentioned your dad, uh, your late father, the the karate great Farhad Varaste. What what would he have made of this percolating revolution in Iran right now if he were? If you were having conversations with him every night, like you you were just a few years ago, what what would he be saying? Do you think? Oh boy, you know he had a, a he had a PhD in in international relations. He would know the inside and outs of of all the political aspects and and everything so much more than I know. Um, but I know that he would he would be supportive. He would be supportive of 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 a, of a change change in regime of of things. I don't want to say going back, but I want to say moving forward, you mm. know, moving forward towards a liberated Iran. You were, in, in recent years, I remember the last time we, we did an interview, um, the national Iranian team mm -hmm. had pursued you uh, to, to be their coach, something that would have involved you returning to Iran as well and, and uh, being the, the coach there. You opted not to take them up on it. Um, how do you feel about that decision in, in, in hindsight? You know, that was obviously before all of this. Yes. And it was even before COVID. And there was just some discussions between myself and the, and the Iranian National Federation. And, you know, it was a dilemma for me, honestly. There was, um, there was on a positive note, to represent my country of birth um, to stand alongside the women of Iran um, would have been a great honor for me. And, you know, my father having the history that he did and mm -hmm. me having the history that I have with uh, Iran, especially in our sport. And I thought, you know, I was going to retire after this, this uh, Olympic cycle, and I thought it would be a nice way to close the circle of my competitive career and my coaching career. Mm -hmm. Um, but the limitations that I would be facing and um, having to wear a you know hijab in competition that was difficult for me to accept. Um, having a basically segregated program between the male and the females is difficult to accept. The fact that like the girls are not able to train and exchange with the men, I think it's very valuable for them. They do that here. It's they, all integrated. They do it mm -hmm. in almost all the countries mm -hmm. across Europe, across Asia, um, basically everywhere. But if you had accepted that, I was mm -hmm. trying to think you, you probably would have been there now through this. I mean, what would I'm it have been? I'm not sure. To like. Uh, I'm not can, sure. I mean, can you imagine being the coach of the? I, I don't even know what what the how you'd be dealing with the situation now. I mean, they're presumably you know you'd be one of those teams grappling with the idea of are we going to sing the national anthem? Are we going to take off our absolutely our head coverings? What absolutely. are we going to do? Right? I don't know. It, it's difficult to say, but it's not a political issue. This is a this is much bigger than that. This is. The, this is a human's right, hu human rights issue. It's yes. not about politics. It's not about well, it is to to some extent, but to a greater extent, it's about it's it's about human rights. Sure. So it's difficult to remain silent on these issues, especially me having had the upbringing that I have. You know, to be defiant, to be resilient, to be to to speak out against things. Um, probably wouldn't have done too well over there. <laughs> probably would have. <laughs> 
I don't want to say anything, but I don't think I would have lost it. Right, right. Or you would have, you would have been a. I could imagine you being another El Nazarekabi or somebody yeah, who's, for sure. who's acting uh, out and then probably suffering the consequences of that. There's been a lot of brave people who've made those decisions. Okay, let me ask you about this last week because yeah. it was the precipitant um, to talk to you uh, at this point this, today. Uh, this provincial karate selection event, I guess the competition that happened here in Canada, yeah. and you and your students and your team dedicated your participation to Mohammed Met- Meti Karami, who was, of course, executed last month. Uh, tell me about the decision to do that. You're wearing the T-shirt today, am, yeah. and we saw this. Th- these images went viral of, of your competitors, some of the kids and, and, and some adults wearing these T-shirts. Tell me about how this came together. Um, our community, to a greater extent, I mean, within within our within our martial arts school, has been. I don't want to say everybody, but the majority have been quite active and either you know, posting things on social media, attending the the rallies and protests that we've had, um, you know, in 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 Toronto. And we started a petition, as you said earlier. We got close to like eleven thousand uh, signatures for for the petition. Um, the petition was for was, specific to Mehdi. Yes, Academy. it was. It was. Um, you know, once we understood that, you know, there was a, a sham trial and he was only given 15 minutes to defend himself in the absence of a defense attorney, all these things. I mean, these are things that we just can't comprehend over here. Like, it just seems, it seems unreal that mm-hmm. these things would happen in this day and age. And, you know, I think for the kids at the dojo at our karate school, they could relate to him. You know, like this is somebody who, you know, who is doing the same sport that that they love. Mm -hmm. And um, so there was already some very strong sentiments about about this, uh, about this situation. And um, and some of the parents organized uh, this event, you know, to kind of like, let's use this platform to uh, raise awareness and to show our 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 solidarity mm-hmm. with uh, with with him and his family and for for his cause and what he stood up for and what he what he now represents mm-hmm. and um sorry two steps back the yeah. martial arts in particular combat sports of all kind of sports mm-hmm. is uh, quite popular in iran yes right yes so there it's natural that there's a a connection for uh, and are are most of the people in your dojo Iranian or the majority are the majority yeah. are yeah so there was already an, an affinity with this sport and and Iran and when you say these kids identified with with Mati Karami it's because this is is it a sport that Iranians in particular excel at as well maybe I mean they're doing they've always historically done very well in combat sports whether it's been wrestling or judo taekwondo Mm -hmm. karate Mm -hmm. they have a very strong international presence um in these sports versus things like athletics and stuff like that um you know and some of these things could just be attributed to the current regime Mm -hmm. um and the 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 many limitations there are in terms of training opportunity or whatnot um so um and I don't want to say that it was just limited to this one person. You know, when like Massa and Nika and yes. Keon and, and all these these kids who've been like taken, um, you know, there was like everybody was heartbroken. But Matty Karami, you're wearing his, yes. his T-shirt. Yeah. Um, I fight for uh, for Karami. I fight for Azadi, Azadi is what yeah. it says. What what do you what have you learned about him? Um, and his, uh, sadly, his short life before he was executed last month. Mm -hmm. It was um, shocking and disgusting and outrageous and all of those things for all of us. But this fellow athlete, this person that inspired you guys to do this competition for him, what have you learned about, what do you know about him and his life and who he was? I mean, at a personal level, not very much. Mm -hmm. You know, but he was a young athlete with lots of aspirations to to become one of the best in the world one day in this in in the sport that he loves, which is something that 
that everybody at, at our dojo can relate to. And, um, and he also believed in freedom. He also believed in, in human rights. He believed in, in democracy. He believed in, in freedom of expression, freedom of thought, freedom of all these things, very much the same way that, that we do here. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we don't, always ha we don't always have the luxury of having a platform um, to, to express ourselves. But the fact that there was somebody within the, the martial arts community, within the same sport, and uh, there was this very recent, um, recent tragic event. And um, we basically wanted to, to, to use our platform to, um, to raise awareness for his cause, mm -hmm. you know? And, and the situation in Iran. I want, I'm gonna ask you about how, what the reaction has been mm -hmm. after uh, the 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 events and you guys fighting for and, and dedicating everything to to uh, Met Academy, but um, but just tell me at, at the at the meet at the provincial meet itself at the event, um, what what kind of reactions were you getting from other teams or other com competitors or the provincial judges? I don't know uh, yeah. um, because I'm I'm assuming this type of thing is not normal that a team comes and ask for a moment of silence and wears a t-shirt yeah, and dedication. Yeah, absolutely not. This, yeah, yeah, it's actually never happened. Like in all my years as 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 a coach or even a competitor at our provincial selection events, um, we've never really had a moment of silence for something, you know, that was uh, like, like a cause of this nature. Um, you know, the reactions were generally positive. Um, the people who were not Iranian, a lot of people would come and ask us like, Hey, what happened? Who is this 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 boy? And what happened? And we would explain to them, and they were shocked. And for the people who knew, they were very proud of what we were doing. They were like, you know what, guys, uh, good for you. And because a lot of people are afraid, a lot of people are afraid to to express themselves, and in, in the fear of uh, you know somebody with some sort of uh, different thought or you know you know some sort of like negative comment mm -hmm, or feedback mm -hmm. and yeah. there was a little bit of that but i would say the most of it was was, there was all a little positive. bit of that there's like the odd person here uh -huh. and there who uh -huh. are like you know who are why are you politicizing the sport yeah a little bit yet? yeah huh. so but just really just one person and too. and i was very moved by it i think i'm I'm speculating this might be one of the reasons why it went viral, but I was very moved by looking at the uh, some of the young people on your team, the yeah. young boys wearing these uh, T-shirts. Tell me about the conversations you would have had with them or that their parents had with them to, for, for their understanding of what they were, yeah. they were doing. You know? They're very well aware of everything. So it's not like they just put on a shirt and they just do what they're told. Um, I can honestly tell you that this, that doing this meant, meant a lot to them. Um, you know, like, like the smallest little ones, like after this, mm. they were, had like tears in their eyes, you know, cause to them it was like, they were really fighting for something that was meaningful and bigger than themselves. Um, and you know, these kids are all coming from, from families where one or both of the parents are, are a Persian. And they can see that their parents are upset, that they're suffering, mm -hmm. that they're consumed with with the media, consumed with the with with the disturbing news, with 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 all these tragedies. And um, you know, they may be young, some of them, but they understand and they see things. You know, like they the the children understand and they they perceive they perceive everything very deeply. What kind of conversations? Your your, your kids are both. Uh, um, razor sharp in terms of their yeah. intellect and, and wits and everything. I mean, uh, what kind of conversations do you have them with them about the situation in Iran? I try not to get into the political details of things. Um, but, you know, I show them footage of people protesting of the women who are in the streets and rip off their hijab and walk in the streets. I'm like, you see this? You know how brave she is for doing that? She's risking her life. Mm -hmm. And 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 they're like wow you know like i show them things um you know even 
when terrible things happen. Like do they that, feel an attach, attach, attachment to being Iranian? Absolutely, uh, they do. Because they're both born uh, here, right? Yeah, they're, uh, they're, they're born here, but both of their parents are Iranian, and, right. and we speak Farsi to the extent that we can at home, and most of our friends are Iranian, and they're even learning to read and write Farsi, too. Wow, and yeah, right, right. I mean, and, and, and at the karate school, most of their friends there are Persian, so they're kind of like interconnected in this in this um, very extensive Iranian community that we have here. So I try to educate them as much as I can. I, I try to show them the, the acts of courage and bravery. And, you know, when, when, when Keon was killed, I, I, I showed his photo to my, to my son and I was like, you see this little boy? And, and he was like, he just couldn't understand mm. how, how, how things like this happen, you know? And, but most of us still can't understand that he's no. not he's not alone no yeah. but i it's, but i but I, but i want them to know like yeah. like i like i don't want them to live in a bubble where they're just disconnected from the world i think it's important for them to see the to see the change so the images of this um video and and the photos of this provincial meet and and you guys wearing the t-shirts and and the dedication um, went viral. I mean, I've seen it on in Persian media and and major personalities sharing this content and stuff. Yeah. Did it surprise you that that, that there was this much um, that it got picked up as much as it did? It did because when we posted it, I mean, listen, we did what we did, and it was very uh, genuine. It wasn't in the hopes of this going viral and this and that, whatever. Yeah. It was very low key we shared you know everybody show, shared some pictures and it was nothing like we didn't we didn't do it with in, in any sort of expectations mm. um and i was surprised and at the same time i think it gives more value for stuff like this you know i think i think that people appreciate um People can appreciate the fact that we were vocal mm. about it, about the fact that we took action to do something within within the greater community. Um, so yeah, you heard from, as I understand, uh, or first of all, I saw, I saw Mehdi Academy's father yes. shared the post or something. But then you were you were telling me that you actually heard from him. Yeah, he sent me a message. Um, basically um, showing his his appreciation for this uh, for this gesture to honor his his son and um, and I got very emotional when I read that what did what did it say um, basically how said, did he find you it was on yeah, Instagram um, or I guess yeah it was it was on Instagram mm -hmm. and um, I guess you know things were already going around right. and and the he he got news of what this you know this small group of of competitors had done in Canada to 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 honor the the life and the memory of his son and um you know he just showed his uh, appreciation and he mm -hmm. said thank you and you guys you guys did a beautiful gesture and i just wanted to send you my my appreciation basically uh, that's uh, it i bet Matty Karami the the late dear Matty Karami mm -hmm. would have probably known who you are and would certainly would have known your father uh, who your father was yeah maybe i mean me mm, there's a little bit of a, i guess after i after the olympics and mm -hmm. before i became more of a of a social figure is that what it's called <laughs> I no guess. I, I don't know yeah. whatever um public figure public figure yes. that's, that's it that's the term um and for sure, I mean, anybody who's in karate in Iran knows my father. Yeah. Because everybody's instructors are somehow related to my father in terms of like the their their lineage. So for sure, and you know. Well, um, thank you, Damit Garm, for the for what you what you did and and for that that kind of awareness. It feels like everybody's. Every, I mean, we've talked about how everybody's trying to find their role, play their role, yeah. and this was a particular point of connection that made a lot of sense. And and 
um, frankly, it's a you know we're a few months in, and there's uh, some emotions are, are are lagging. People are worried that there's you know that um, that the enthusiasm is is dropping, etc. So um, any new uh, and inventive ways to to show support seem to be really valuable for the broader community. Um, I didn't know that was a thing that there was like I thought the momentum has just shifted from you know more activism um, away from within Iran to more to outside like international pressure exactly and, and that's uh, we were just talking about that yeah. actually but well I mean that's yes that's it's it's the revolution is outside of Iran right now yes. in terms of the the, the activism that, that we see on a daily basis um, some people that inter interpret that as you know what's going on why aren't there more people in the streets in Iran etc but um, but we know part of the reality of that and, and we absolutely know, yeah. we know that this, it's a marathon not a sprint um, y you are someone that was born you were born as your family was escaping Iran in the aftermath of the revolution uh, um, 42 years ago. Uh, are you, I guess as a, as a final thought, are you optimistic for the future of Iran? Absolutely. I absolutely am I'm optimistic. You know, I think everything that has happened will not be forgotten. And this next generation and all the, like, of the children in Iran right now, and the youth and the teenagers and, and everybody, they're gonna continue to pursue their dream of a free Iran. They will. Um, I think they've seen too much, they've experienced too much, and I think they, they see the rest of the world and they know what they want and they know how they want to live. They know the life that they know they are um, entitled to have, mm. but they are denied of. Um, so I think it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. Thanks for this today. Good to yeah, see you. Thank you. Likewise. We'll come back and talk more about your the, the sport and your life again uh, at some point. But um, but the primacy of what's going on in Iran and, and your role in, in, in helping has been an important conversation today. Always good to see you. Thank you, Gian. Thanks, Good Nassim. to see you, too. Nassim Varaster here live in the Rook studio, and this is full time for this edition of Rook. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together: Sabi Roham, talented Anahita, Super Parisa, Smart Pega, Hai Merdan, and Gubi Shaya. Thank you to all of you out there supporting us, sharing our content, subscribing. Uh, do subscribe if you've not done so already. You can find all of our Rook information, our back episodes, our videos, our funnies, our outtakes, our different programming, including the Contemporary History of Iran series at rookmedia.com. Rookmedia.com, where you can also press the Support Us button to support us. Find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. Mizobashi. Bashi.